Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, just settle in and we will get started shortly. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Room to Roam, the Benefits of Wildlife Infrastructure. My name is Jennifer Schultz, Program Principal in NCSL's Environment, Energy and Transportation Program, and I will be your moderator. This is, there we go. <laughs> this is the fifth webinar in a series of five hosted by NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee this spring. Slides and recordings for the other webinars are posted on NCSL's website. I would also like to thank the Pew Charitable Trust for their support of our work on today's topic. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Feel free to type your questions at any time and we will address them at the end. Our webinar today is being recorded and you can access the recording on the website in a few days. With that, let's jump into our topic. Today we will explore the use of wildlife corridors and other tools available to policymakers to reduce habitat fragmentation, wildlife vehicle collisions and associated costs. We have three speakers with extensive experience from the legislative, executive and nonprofit sides. First up, we have Matt Scroach. He directs Pew's efforts to conserve wildlife corridors in the West, bringing together scientists, policymakers and management. Before coming to Pew, Scroach worked with cons conservation organizations in Arizona, New Mexico, and Northwest Mexico, overseeing programs focused on wildlife corridor conservation, wilderness protection, habitat restoration, and private land conservation. Matt, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer, uh, and thanks to the NCSL team for hosting us today. It's great to be with you virtually. Um, yes, uh, Jennifer already introduced myself, so I'll skip that. Um, for my presentation, I'm going to spend some time at 30,000 feet talking about road ecology and conservation planning, and then we're going to dive into infrastructure um, components of this issue specifically, ending with a look at the policy side of the issue and leaving you with some thoughts about what may be possible in your state. Uh, next slide, please. So let's just look at the country, right? We, we've got 4 million plus miles of roads that zigzag all over the place. Uh, we can go to the moon and back like nine times with the number of miles of roads we have in our country. 164,000 miles of federal highway alone. Um, now having all of those roads that connect everything to everywhere is great and convenient. Uh, for those of us who don't live in a cave and want to get to where we wanna go quickly, um, you know, the engineers of these millions of roads, most of which were sited and built in the 19, in the mid 1900s or so, really weren't thinking about their roads environmental impact. You know, habitat fragmentation was really a concept yet to be born. The mantra then, and even in some degree today now is, um, is the more roads, the better. Um, next slide, please. Well, you know, it turns out, as you can imagine, there are some real consequences to our nation's road network. And I'm not going to speak to the issues of air, water, noise pollution, or invasive species spread, but we do know that roads are directly or indirectly the leading cause of biodiversity decline via habitat loss and fragmentation. Now, if you're a fish, a deer, a turtle, a grizzly bear, or pretty much other, any other species of wildlife, um, roads do mean trouble. 
They cut off seasonal migration routes, they reduce movement options, they create bottlenecks and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. In that vein, more than a million large mammals such as elk, deer and pronghorn are killed each year on our nation's roads by cars and trucks. Uh, in Colorado, for instance, as many deer are killed by cars as they are by hunters. Uh, and really, us humans pay a price as well. We spend about $8 billion on wildlife vehicle collisions nationally each year. More than 25,000 of us are injured from these collisions each year, hundreds of fatalities. And especially in rural areas, wildlife vehicle collisions can make up a sizable, you know, sometimes half of all accidents reported. Uh, I'm betting at least a few of us here have personal experience with hitting or almost hitting an animal on a road. So I've outlined in, in real brief, you know, the problem, roads and wildlife don't go very well together and us homo sapiens um, get dinged too. And I'll also say that the problem is getting worse. You know, especially in the West with the boom that's occurring in XYZ mountain town now that people have, are, are less tethered to a big city office. You know, more traffic, more roads, more habitat fragmentation and wildlife vehicle collisions and, and really less wildlife and nobody wants that. So don't even get me started on how climate change all fits into this, but suffice to say, it's not helping at all. Now, um, with the slide that we have before us, with a promise to come back to, to the roads and wildlife issue, I want you to just hold your thoughts about all that for a moment and let me briefly switch gears and talk about the broader concept of landscape connectivity and landscape conservation. You know, these are ideas generated by academics, championed by various NGOs, and roughly involve conserving a combination of core habitat patches, think like national parks or even state wildlife areas, along with functional and permeable corridors of habitat that lie in between or connect those patches. To be sure, these in-between areas, they're, they're nothing like a true wilderness or a park usually, but they allow for wildlife movement between habitat patches and turn out to be really, really important components of any local, regional, or national conservation approach. We know that we must maintain these connections or reconnect habitat patches if we want to stem the extinction, extinction, extinction crisis that's before us now. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> this is what a wildlife corridor looks like in real life. And it turns out that while we've known that the concept of wildlife corridors that we saw in the previous slide has been really important for conservation work for decades, it really has only been in the last 10 years or so that research and technology have allowed us to define them with a high level of confidence. And it's thanks to that nifty collar on the mule deer shown in this, in this photo to the right that tells a satellite where it's located every few hours. And I'm not gonna go down this rabbit hole too much, but you should know that these little contraptions are at the foundation of big changes happening now in wildlife conservation efforts. This particular corridor lies in southwest Wyoming. It's 150 mile long seasonal mule deer migration known as the Red Desert to Hoback migration. It's a great example of how we can now define with pinpoint accuracy real corridors that are key to maintaining our wildlife heritage. So thanks for indulging my wildlife corridor tangent. Let's connect it back now to our original topic. And, and you can piece it together, right? The biggest problem that these functional corridors face or, or should I say the animals that use them are roads, right? So what now? Next slide, please. After all that, you know, the millions of dead animals, the 8 billion we spend on wildlife vehicle collisions, the injuries and human fatalities, there is a solution at hand. These solutions are simple, they're effective, and they pay for themselves long before they're obsolete. They come in the form of wildlife bridges and underpasses structures designed to facilitate wildlife movement over or under the road instead of onto it, therefore creating safe passage for both critters and drivers alike. Now, science is currently feeding us gobs of information about wildlife movement every day via those GPS collars. So we now have incredible vision into where and how these structures can be placed 
with greatest benefit to both wildlife and humans. It is an absolute win-win and the beginning and, and the idea is really beginning to blossom into real outcomes uh, within state governments all over the country. Next slide, please. Here's one example in, from Wyoming again, where the state has identified the frequency of wildlife vehicle collisions on, on essentially every single mile of highway. Um, you might be able to see the red segments and the orange circles that delineate problem areas across the states. They've identified priorities and have begun planning numerous construction projects to address this issue. It's just one example of how science is really driving innovation and action at the state level. Um, but if we go to the next slide, Let's switch gears a little bit and, and talk more about these solutions in, in that policy context, which frankly is what I want you to remember if you remember anything from the 15 minutes you've spent listening uh, to me ramble here. I'm passing over details, but we've identified the problem. We have the solution. So, so really what's up now? What's, what's the holdup? And, and in a large sense, it's, it's about money, of course. Um, I'll argue that it's a much better problem to have versus 10 or 20 years ago when we didn't know much at all about how to solve this problem. I think I mentioned that for many years, you know, nothing much happened in this space, uh, especially, especially at the policy level. But in the last three years, a veritable sea change has begun to occur and momentum at the state level on addressing this issue really continues to build. Now, forgive my visual focus on the West here. It's, it's indicative of what's happening all over the country, um, largely as a result of that new re real world science about corridors that's begun to flow. 2019 kicked off with a bang for new wildlife corridor policy at the state level. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that it didn't really stop in 2019. It continued to build um, in 2020. Not only are state legislatures starting to take action, but a number of executive orders uh, from, from governors, as well as administrative policies that are coming out of both state DOTs and state wildlife agencies. Next slide, please. 2021 was an amazing year. Nevada at the federal level, we had Bureau of Land Management new policy in that state. We had the governor's executive orders in New Mexico and Nevada, um, among a number of other great things. And really at the next slide, 2022, we're not even halfway done yet, it takes the cake. I mean, this year we've seen states allocate tens of millions of dollars for wildlife crossings. And in addition to what you see here, um, we can now add Colorado and Washington to this map, um, given what's, what's also incurred in those states. And I'm, I'm excited uh, over the fact that we're, we're honored to have Senator Stewart as a part of this panel, who was instrumental in, in the win most recently in New Mexico. So this is pretty incredible, right? I mean, these are all, quote, firsts for wildlife-friendly infrastructure funding and corridor policy. I'll go so far as to say that in the 25 years I've been doing wildlife conservation work, I have really never seen such an incredible wave of new conservation policy making and funding um, that, that we're witnessing as, as much as what we're witnessing right now. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, what states are doing is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, no doubt you're at least somewhat familiar with the new federal infrastructure and highways bill. What I wanna highlight in IIJA is the creation of the Wildlife Crossings Pilot Program. It's a new uh, tool, it's cool, it's $350 million in competitive grant funds dedicated solely to building these magnificent wildlife crossing structures. Combined with the incredible action that's happening at the state level, um, this federal program is, is really gonna help mainstream these solutions like never before. Um, state DOTs are the primary applicants for this program, and there's going to be a match required, maybe sometime uh, somewhere around 20%. Uh, we don't know yet because Federal Highways hasn't stood the program up yet. It's just brand new, but that's another story. And all I can say is that they're working on it. Um, I do have a slide deck dedicated just to what's in IIJA for Wildlife Corridors. So if you want to know more, shoot me a note. Next slide, please. 
the state initiatives that we've seen in the last three years, and especially just in this legislative season, season in 2022, are without exception bipartisan. Two weeks ago, as Colorado, uh, Colorado's SB 22151 was passed with, with near unanimous support, um, providing $5 million for wildlife state funds for wildlife crossing structures, among other things. Um, the rural Republican representative, Perry Wills, who was a primary co-sponsor of this measure, declared that the effort was the most important thing he's done in his time in the legislature thus far. Um, Pew and others have done several polls across the states and found incredible support for this issue. We've seen numbers in the 90th percentile for support across parties, across rural urban divides. It's probably not that surprising really because people love win-wins and that's what these wildlife crossings deliver on a consistent basis at this point. As for stakeholders, I'll use the recent Colorado campaign as an example. Um, naturally, the conservation and environmental groups were lined up in support, but so were the property and casualty insurance um, uh, companies. The Colorado State Patrol Union was in support of the bill. Even the American Petroleum Institute was in support of um, being able to create policy and put funds toward wildlife friendly transportation infrastructure. That is saying something, right? Put a coalition like that together and it's tough to lose. I'll mention the fact that these bills, which all differ a bit from one another, but generally require a state's wildlife and transportation departments to work together, are having a really positive impact on interdepartmental collaboration, especially in the case of DOTs becoming more aware of and in tune with wildlife issues. And I bet Sydney is gonna tell us more about that in a little bit. As I bet many of you know, DOTs are regimented in how they do things, but they are increasingly understanding and embracing the value and the return on investment derived from these structures. And lastly, a big selling point for this issue with elected officials is that a little state money goes a long way to bring home federal dollars. Lawmakers like the idea of putting in a little and getting back a lot, and that's how these federal highway grant programs generally work. So with the next slide, please. I'm gonna leave you there. Um, it is an awesome time to be working on this issue. I'm sure you can't tell my enthusiasm, um, but the numbers and the success just this year speak for themselves. Um, and with the leadership of people like Senator Stewart, with what Sydney's doing in Oregon and what so many others are doing all across the country, not just in the West, Virginia and Florida and Pennsylvania and elsewhere, it is an amazing time to be pushing this issue forward and creating new policy with new capacity to solve the extinction crisis and to really restore and maintain our wildlife heritage. So I'll send it back to you, Jennifer, thank you. And we look forward to, uh, to the talks at hand. Okay, thank you, Matt. I think that was um, a great inspiring overview. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Uh, but now we will move on to our next speaker. We have Mimi Stewart, New Mexico Senate President Pro Tem. Senator Stewart was raised in the Southwest and has lived in Albuquerque for 42 years. She retired from the Albuquerque Public School District after 30 years as an elementary special education teacher. In the legislature, she has a long history of championing educational, environmental, women and good governance policies. Senator Stewart, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, just great to be here. This is a very exciting topic. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Matt's uh, conversation and I will pick up uh, some of the things he said in my presentation. So let me just give you a really brief overview of how we started in New Mexico, because we've got now a kick-ass Wildlife Quarters Act, but it didn't start just a few years ago. It started with a statewide student group called the Wild Friends. And if any of you know Ruth Musgrave, who works with the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, she lived in New Mexico at that time. And they set up a statewide group of students that wanted to work on wildlife. So I was in the legislature 
uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> so can't believe I've been there that long. I started to do what we call memorials for the wild friends. They're like study bills. They don't have the force of law, uh, but they put in place policies that we all want to work on. So the first memorial was in 2009 and the wild friends wanted the Indian nation tribes of Pueblos uh, to work together on key wildlife corridors. Uh, to fill in data gaps, to look at where we could impact uh, the, the damage done to wildlife and to uh, human vehicles also. Uh, so a couple of years later, in 2011, we got more specific with the memorial and we asked our Department of Transportation, our Department of Game and Fish, and state police to actually create a little pilot on I-40 going east out of Albuquerque. And that was very successful. They used uh, fencing and, and uh, flashing lights at night to try to direct uh, these big game animals uh, into a small culvert uh, underneath I-40. It worked on a very limited basis. Um, uh, next slide, Jennifer. Uh, so um, uh, being a member of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators for, for many years, I started hearing about uh, wildlife corridors. And so I worked for several years to put together um, this Wildlife Corridors Act. And, and we finally got it passed in March 28, 2019. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Next slide. So what this act did was to require the Department of Transportation and the Department of Game and Fish to identify and try to start working on protecting wildlife corridors. Um, they had to come up with a wildlife corridors action plan. And I'm happy to tell you that they finished that plan in January, February of this year. Um, and they, they took two years and they really did an incredible job. As Matt talked about, some of these big game, um, the Department of Game and Fish has put collars. Um, I actually got a chance to ride with them in their small planes, uh, looking at uh, New Mexico to try to look at where these quarters are. And you could actually see them. They could fly uh, over their quarters because of those collars. Uh, so um, the Department of Game and Fish and Department of Transportation uh, spent these last two years. I was able to get $500,000 from the Department of Transportation budget dedicated to do the search and the plan. So an important part of that was to ensure that Game and Fish Department of Transportation consulted with our tribal governments. We have 19 Pueblos. Uh, tribes in New Mexico and three reservations. Uh, in a minute, you'll see a, a map of it. So uh, next slide. Uh, the, the tribal uh, members in our state are better at animal wildlife protection than the rest of us are. They, they, their whole outlook is, uh, is on nature and protecting nature. So they are good partners for us. Uh, they've been some of our best partners as we go forward. So with that plan, um, this action plan, they had to identify highway crossings. As Matt said, it's a huge risk, but there are other human caused barriers uh, that negatively impact wildlife habitats. So their job was to also look at those um, and to get that information about our movement of the large animals, which we've done. Um, and then to look at the impacts of climate change and drought. Uh, the Southwest is being severely impacted as we all are, the entire globe. Uh, in, in the Southwest, uh, our weather is uh, hot and dry. It's getting hotter and drier and it's impacting where animals go for food and protection and habitat. Uh, so, um, uh, next slide. 
Uh, so their job was also to set up maps uh, and show those areas of greatest concern, to do look at protocols for how to monitor our wildlife corridors to see if they're working well, um, to look at economic benefits um, and, and set up opportunities, collaborate, a joint powers agreement with, with our tribes, nations, and pueblos, and our farmers and ranchers. But their job really was to reach out to everyone. I should tell you that now this slide that I'm using was actually put together by the Department of Transportation to go around the state to tell people about this new Wildlife Corridors Act. Next slide. So um, private landowners uh, really needed to be part of this work. And so the Department of Transportation went all over the state and had these uh, uh, meetings with the communities. Uh, you can see that we've got the orange on the map are the air, tribal areas. Uh, the pink is the Department of Defense. Uh, that's, um, uh, that is, uh, uh, that pink is, um, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of it. <laughs> I'll think about it in a minute. Uh, so you see, we've got our state land office. When New Mexico became a state 100 years ago, uh, our um, enabling legislation ensured that we had funding for education. And so we've kind of got a checkerboard around the state where it's state lands and the funding that we get from either leasing or mineral rights from those state lands goes into a land grant permanent fund. So we have plenty of state lands that we can uh, help use as wildlife corridors. Next slide. So we have 20 species of concern. We have six big game. Uh, Matt already mentioned it's the pronghorn antelope, deer and elk, uh, cougars, uh, bears. I always miss one. I'll think of that in a minute. Um, but we also have these smaller species, uh, many of whom are on the endangered species list. And they often track and follow the core, same quarters as big game animals. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is the top five hotspots and the top six quarters that they have identified um, uh, using all these procedures and people. Next slide. So this is just, uh, Matt showed you that wonderful overpass. These are some of the underpasses. Um, they're actually these, one of these is from Arizona and one of these is from Utah. One of these is from New Mexico. Next slide. And these are the overpasses. I can't wait till we build an overpass in New Mexico. There's Utah's on I-80 going in place, Arizona, Nevada. If you haven't seen the one in Banff, uh, Canada, it's just gorgeous. And California is about to do a huge cougar overpass. Uh, next slide. I think, uh, all right, this is my last slide for you. So it's just a map of New Mexico um, from the Department of Transportation identifying the top five uh, vehicle crash uh, hotspots. Uh, we're spending about $20 million every 10 years on uh, vehicle damage, on death of our wildlife and harm to people also. Um, so to me, our economic benefits is clear if we can uh, stop killing as much wildlife through our cars. And so uh, we don't have much time to talk about this. I'm just so appreciative of our National Caucus of Environmental Legislators for bringing us together on these issues and for the incredible work that everyone in New Mexico has done for this wildlife corridor. Well, thank you, Senator Stewart. I know it's a it's a busy day for you, so um, I appreciate you being with us today. Our third speaker is Sydney Bowman, the Wildlife Passage Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Transportation. In this role, she works to increase safety for drivers and wildlife across the state. She began her career at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife before working as a regional biologist and NOAA liaison for ODOT. She has been in her current role for eight years. Sydney. 
Go Thank ahead. you, Jennifer. Um, as you just said, I've been in the position for a little over eight years. And in that time, the Wildlife Passage Program at ODOT has been an unfunded program. So a lot of what I do is focused on education and outreach. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh, can you see me now? Yes, we can. Okay, see. sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, so yeah, it's been an unfunded program. So a lot of what I do is focus on education and outreach, serving on project teams to incorporate wildlife passage when and where it makes sense, and then acting as a liaison to our local, state, and federal partners. At ODOT, our maintenance crews do a great job of recording where large carcasses are removed from the highway. So from this data, we know that there are on average 7,000 wildlife vehicle collisions every year on ODOT highways. And we know this number is very conservative since most animals are struck on the highway, wander off, and then die later. So this number is actually really closer to three to five times that 7,000 figure. Each year we have over 700 people that are seriously injured as a result of these collisions and an average of two fatalities per year. And we also know that there's about an estimated $44 million in vehicle damage each year as a result of these collisions. This is a map from that ODOT maintenance data showing the locations of wildlife vehicle collisions around the state over a five-year period. So green is low density, yellow and orange are medium density, and red is high density. These data can be used to show where wildlife are being killed on Oregon highways. And what I, I like to show this because it's not an east side or a west side issue, it's not an urban or a rural issue, but it's really something that can affect all Oregonians. What this map doesn't show us is where wildlife are getting across the highway successfully. And it also doesn't show us where highways are already a barricade to movement. And because ODOT's focused on large mammals uh, for safety reasons, we also don't have a good idea of where the smaller wildlife are getting killed trying to cross highways. So ODOT's Wildlife Passage Program does not have a dedicated funding source, as I mentioned earlier. So in addition to the projects you see here, efforts have focused on education and outreach at our DMV offices, creating driver's education materials, including driving tip brochures and posters to raise awareness of wildlife vehicle collisions. We update our variable message signs at key deer and elk migration corridors during peak migration times to warn drivers of wildlife on the highway. We've been clearing vegetation adjacent to the highway to increase visibility and incorporating wildlife passage into projects when and where it makes sense to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. So far, the larger undercrossing projects have been opportunistic where there was a large highway project or a new alignment. Structures in Oregon have taken the form of undercrossings, fence to utilize new culverts or standalone fencing projects. Our ODOT monitoring demonstrates a high likelihood of success of passage projects where constructed. For example, the Lava Butte project uh, that was created in Central Oregon resulted in an 85% reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions and over 30 species successfully passed under the highway. And this success is echoed in other states and countries. I wanna focus on the recent Gilchrist Wildlife Undercrossing Project to demonstrate one way that ODOT is trying to, fund, to fund wildlife passage projects. So this was a project that took place on Highway 97, just south of Bend um, in, the, in the, central, the central part of the state. And in 2020, ODOT constructed a passing lane project and included construction of this wildlife undercrossing shown on the left as part of the project. And it was designed to get deer and elk underneath the highway. The site was selected because of the high number of wildlife vehicle collisions in the stretch of highway. And coincidentally, a large bridge that was already existing three miles of the south, shown here in the center, was already passing deer and elk successfully. So this was a great way to leverage existing infrastructure and get two undercrossings for the price of one. Because the undercrossing was added late to the project, there wasn't enough money to install the necessary fencing and gear guards at the access points. And so we had to fundraise over a million dollars to complete this project. We were able to do the first phase, fencing six miles in total between the two bridges last year. And we just received a federal grant to complete the fencing two miles to the north of the new bridge um, that, this coming summer. So this required a large number of partnerships with state, federal, and nonprofit partners, both for the funding and for the maintenance of the fence. So the next slide um, shows just a handful of the partners 
that were responsible for helping get this project built. Um, and while it was successful and great, it's taken us over five years to complete this single project. So in addition to providing funding for the project, um, the Oregon Hunters Association has taken on maintenance for the fence along um, all the projects and along the 97 corridor. So each spring and fall, they go out and inspect the wildlife fencing and make any needed repairs before the migration season begins. This is done to reduce the workload for our ODOT maintenance crews who don't have the time or money to do this important work. So ODOT is looking to these groups to continue to help fund projects at some level to demonstrate um, their priorities um, in Oregon. These same groups have been pushing for ODOT to do more for wildlife passage, including supporting legislation for wildlife passage. So next slide. So House Bill 2834 was introduced in the 2019 legislative session and is very similar to New Mexico's bill. The bill essentially formalized the coordination that was already occurring between ODOT and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and was passed unanimously. The bill requires the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to identify critical corridors in Oregon needed to preserve long-term habitat connectivity for wildlife. Once these corridors are identified, our two agencies must work together to develop a wildlife corridor action plan. And this plan will provide guidance to all of our state agencies for designation and protection of wildlife corridors. ODOT also has to establish or further establish a wildlife passage program to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions in areas where these corridors intersect with proposed or existing state roads. And we have until the end of next year to do that. And until the um, ODOT establishes this program, we're to work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to coordinate efforts to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. So we anticipate that ODFW will have a, um, their first quarters released at the end of this year, and then we'll begin work on the, on the quarter action plan. Looking to leverage federal funding opportunities, a working group, um, or I should say that for House Bill 2834, there was no funding provided with that legislation. So with the recent passage of the federal um, transportation bill, um, we we're looking to leverage funding opportunities. And so a working group was formed to try and find a new funding source for wildlife passage. Legislation looked at increasing a vehicle registration fee. It, so that was considered, but not carried forward. Ultimately, the legislature did provide a one-time $7 million allocation to ODOT that uh, is to be dedicated for the purpose of funding projects that reduce the number of wildlife vehicle collisions and improve habitat connectivity for wildlife. So ODOT is currently working to construct projects as well as leverage these funds with new grant programs for wildlife passage. So looking forward, ODOT is looking to demonstrate a need for a permanent state funding source and an ability to deliver projects in a timely manner. We're also looking to complete feasibility studies along key corridors to inform our project planning. And we're also continuing to work with our research division to um, find new ways to use technology to decrease collisions. So we were recently approved for a project looking at computer learning to minimize monitoring costs and develop technology that can eventually be used to alert drivers to wildlife on the highway. And similar to Colorado, we're looking to create a coalition of local, state, federal, and tribal and nonprofit partners to help ODOT determine priorities and pool resources to help fund these important projects. And with that, I'll just say thank you. Okay, thank you, Sydney. And thank you to all of our panelists. I'd like to shift gears now to questions. Um, we do have plenty of time. So if you have a question, uh, please go ahead and type it in the chat and we will get that addressed. I see that um, Matt went ahead and responded to um, a couple of questions um, around design specifics. Uh, Matt, is that something, or, or maybe our other speakers would like to address with the group? You know, I wonder if Sydney might might have a more to say on that, given her practitioner um, experience in, in this realm. Sure. So let me just paraphrase. Um, is there a certain width that has been determined to provide a safe corridor for wildlife without also creating a buffet line for predatory animals? Um, and then the second question, is there a push for tunneling below and reinforcing existing roads, especially in flatter areas, instead of creating large bridges? Hmm. 
Um, so I, I think I get that question a lot, about, a lot about if we're creating a buffet line for hunters and for, for predators, but in our um, monitoring, we haven't seen that. Uh, these animals aren't moving, you know, constantly 24 seven through these undercrossings. So that's definitely some more sporadic, um, at least in the case of, of Central Oregon. We do have some standard um, widths. I, I don't have those with me. I can certainly provide those to the, to the commenter. Um, and then in, in the Gilfrest project, we did have to actually excavate below um, underground to get the clearance needed. So we've kind of tried experimenting with these different techniques since not a lot is known about how to use these approaches in flatter areas. So we're hoping that can contribute to, to some of these design standards. And if I can uh, say in New Mexico, the we, we have plenty of culverts that were built originally with the uh, with the highways. We are trying to turn those into a, a, a wildlife underpass because uh, the culverts sometimes are too small and too narrow. Um, and we're trying to make underpasses and overpasses uh, for quarters that, that any of these animals can use. We've actually gotten uh, cameras from Arizona and put them into some of these culverts so that we know who's using the culverts already. Uh, so uh, an overpass is really the most expensive answer to wildlife corridors. So we are not starting with overpasses everywhere. We're trying to incorporate uh, underpasses and other kind of signage and fencing in, in, into the existing Department of Transportation work right now. So we have uh, uh, Department of Transportation working all over the state and they're trying to uh, think about wildlife corridors while they either repair or renew existing uh, traffic. Well, thank you, that was a, that was a great question. Um, panelists, uh, since I don't see any questions coming in at the moment. Uh, I wonder if you'd like to provide maybe some of your key takeaways um, to our audience or um, a place to start for legislators who may be interested. Uh, Matt, why don't I, I start with you if that's all right? Yeah, I'll, I can reinforce um, some of, of some of my closing slide. You know, with a lot of states as, as folks here, I think know well, uh, a lot of states have budget surpluses right now. And um, like I said, the solution here is pretty straightforward. It just takes money. Um, there's still a lot of science and research that's, that's driving this that we still need to do, but we have projects stacked up, ready to go in, in just about every state uh, waiting, waiting for funds. And so um, that, is, that is my takeaway is that now is a really opportune time given the, the surpluses, the federal capacity that's now available as a result of IIJA, and obviously the politics and just the, the public sentiment around this issue and the win-win opportunity that it provides, provides lawmakers to deliver to their constituents. Um, that's, that's my takeaway. And uh, I agree with Matt. I mean, that's the reason that we have money in our budget that we just ended in March is because of a surplus. And also that we've been working on this quarter's action plan for two years. Uh, I think it's really key. Department of Transportations and Game and Fish are key. They're the two agencies that need to work together, that generally are working together. And... Uh, it's really why I started with the, my story about the Wild Friends stu Student Network is because, because of them and the memorials we did, they were already used to working together on wildlife issues. Uh, so to require them to come up with a, a quarter action plan um, and to do that on a regular basis, um, that was kind of more natural for them after working together and working on those issues. So, you know, start with those two agencies. Uh, so I think the infrastructure bill is also key. I'm fairly certain the only reason the 2 million uh, uh, 
made it through the budget in New Mexico was that we kept saying, we need a state match. We need a state match. We won't get the federal money without a state match. And so uh, I, I wanna put more in uh, this next year. So I'm hoping that infrastructure bill uh, will kind of get decided soon and will be flushed out to the state so that we can use it more because we're ready. We, we want 50 million right now. <laughs> So. Yeah, I would just say for Oregon, um, we've been really lucky and successful with our um, partnerships with nonprofits and other agencies, but these projects can be expensive. And so having a state funding source, I think is going to be very critical to help continue the, the, um, the momentum that started and to get more projects built on the ground and to maintain them over time. I do see another question. Let's see. Um, I don't want to shortchange our commenter, so I'll go ahead and read it for those who aren't able to see. Um, I like the idea of technology to alert drivers of upcoming animals currently on the road. Does that seem more monetarily feasible for rural areas where traffic density is so low that animals aren't spooked by traffic? and the existence of a corridor doesn't necessarily entice animals to use it. How many cameras or sensors per mile would make them useful? Well, you know, in New Mexico, when we started with that second Wild Friends Memorial, that's exactly what we did use. We used lighting, um, especially at night, uh, to attract animals to put them into that culvert area. Um, we used fencing where they were getting onto the highway. We put up fencing. So it, it, it is true that you can uh, impact uh, wildlife with, with less than underpasses or overpasses, which are more expensive. But, but you have to, you know, you have to really know what you're doing. Uh, in, the, in Southern Colorado, they use um, fencing, I think, pretty well. Um, the fencing is very high so that the deer and elk can't get over it on that road directly from New Mexico up to the Durango area. So you can start small. And I think, I think what we really need to do is use every available uh, mechanism, uh, overpass, underpasses, fencing, lighting, uh, sounds, uh, to make animals uh, go in the right direction, all of that. And, and that's certainly what we're doing in New Mexico. And I know they're doing it in Colorado. Yeah, I would say that, oh, sorry, Matt, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, Sydney. Um, definitely agree with the all tools approach. Um, you know, there's a lot of situations where in different, different solutions um, make more sense than others. Specific to the question around sensors and lighting to warning drivers, there's, there has been limited success with that in, in a number of places. It's really hard to get drivers to slow down or pay attention to those signs. Um, you know, your, your typical just stationary static sign that says, you know, deer crossing next six miles. They, we know that that has very little effect on being able to slow drivers down. If you put flashing lights on it uh, based uh, from a sensor that can sense movement of wildlife on the road, it might have somewhat of an effect, but it's still not that effective from what we found. And those things break, the lights go out, the sensor doesn't work. It's tough to get you know, the repair crews out there fixing it, they go, and then the public is confused because maybe they see a deer on the road and the lighting's not working. So um, it, there are problems, but I don't wanna panic completely because I think some of the newer technology might be able to improve those specific systems. Of course, the cheapest and most effective way to keep wildlife off roads is to just you know, create an impermeable barrier along the side of the road, a 10 foot uh, wildlife fence with no crossing structure at all. And, that will solve the driver problem, the, the safety problem, right? But that's not providing that win-win. It's, um, it's not really contributing to the environmental or ecological um, values that a lot of people want to be able to solve as well in these. 
Okay, well, last opportunity for questions, anyone? Um, but I'll just go ahead and extend a final thank you to our presenters. Uh, we greatly appreciate the expertise each of you shared today. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for joining. I know we're a little early, which, you know, it's kind of refreshing on a Thursday afternoon. Um, so I will, I will just go ahead and end there. I hope you all have a great rest of the week and summer. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of you at our uh, legislative summit in Denver early August. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.